Welcome to Electron Online and now we're going to take a look at Ampere's Law and how it gives us some more information about electromagnetic radiation. So what we're doing here is we have a plane wave. This is the front of the wave. This is basically the front end of an expanding electromagnetic uh, radiation wave that's coming at the observer. If it's, if it's far enough away from the dipole antenna, it looks like a flat plane wave. It's what, what we have over here. That's the front of the wave and this is what's coming behind it. We take a small enough region so that the electric field and the magnetic field oscillation at the moment are basically just frozen in time. There's really no change between here and here. If we take the distance, a small enough distance, notice that this is the velocity of the wave, speed of light. And if you use your right hand, you can say if you point your fingers in the direction of the electric field, curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, your thumb will point in the direction of the wave motion. Now what we're doing here is we're using Ampere's law which says that if we integrate, do a closed loop integral of the strength of the B field times the path length and the direction of that path, we should, that should equal the mu sub naught times the current enclosed plus mu sub naught epsilon sub naught times the change with respect to time of the flux of the electric field. Now what we don't have here is we don't have any currents. There's no current lines or of any sort. So for our purpose, this portion right here simply goes to zero. We don't have to worry about that. So all we have to do is just integrate around a closed loop path. And the path that we chose right here is this horizontal path going from there to there, back this way like this, in the same plane as the direction of the magnetic field. Now we're going to integrate along these four sections of the path. And notice that if we take the front section right here, there's no magnetic field right here because the electromagnetic radiation hasn't yet reached that position. So therefore, the integral right here, the path length A times the strength of the magnetic field is simply equal to zero. So the first one would be zero, and that would be for path one. For path two, notice that here we do cross magnetic field lines, but we cross them perpendicular to the field. And since this is a dot product, remember that the magnetic field dotted with the DL that is going to be equal to the strength of the field times the L times the cosine of the angle between the two. And notice in this case, the angle between the two is 90 degrees and the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So therefore we get zero contribution from this integral right there. So it would be plus zero from the second section of the line. On the third section, we do have a contribution. Notice here that the path length and the direction of B field is in the same direction. They're parallel to each other, so they do add. So it's going to be the, the magnitude of the B field times the magnitude of the length, which is equal to A, times the cosine of the angle between them, which is zero degrees. The cosine of zero is one. So here we get the contribution plus B times A. That's for the third segment. And on the fourth segment, notice, we get zero again because it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, so we get zero contribution of that, plus zero, that's for the fourth segment, and that should equal, since that's equal to zero, mu sub naught times epsilon sub naught times a change in the electric flux as a function of time. So all we have to do now is determine what that change in the electric, the electric flux is that is inside this loop. Notice that through the loop we have electromagnetic field lines going this way, so there is going to be a change in the flux because notice there's no flux here and there's flux there. All right, so now on the left side we have B times A plus, oh, not, not plus because there's nothing left on the left side of the equation, that equals mu sub naught times epsilon sub naught times the change of the flux with respect to time. But remember, the electric flux is equal to the strength of the field times the area. And we notice that the strength of the field does not change because we took a small enough region right here. So that's a fixed number. So that's going to be equal to E times the change in the area with respect to time. All right, and the area, of course, is equal to the width times the length. So this would be B times A is equal to mu sub naught, epsilon sub naught, times electric field strength, times the change with respect to time of A times C times DT. That would be the area, that would be A times the length here, which is C times DT. Remember, distance is velocity times time, distance is velocity C times the time DT. So notice that A and C will be constants, so this can be written as B times A is equal to mu sub naught, epsilon sub naught, E times A times C times DT over DT. 
And of course, dt divided by dt, that's equal to 1. And I notice we have an a on both sides, so that cancels out. So now what we have is that the magnetic field strength B is equal to mu sub naught times epsilon sub naught times E times C. All right, now let's compare this to what we got when we used uh, Faraday's law and did the same thing. We got E equals C times B. So if E is equal to C times B and B is equal to mu sub naught epsilon sub naught E times C, we should be able to relate those two equations equal to each other. In other words, we're going to write, hmm, let's see here. How about if we write E equal to C times B and see what we get? So we're going to combine these two equations together. And we're going to replace E by B times C. Then we get on the left side, B is equal to mu sub naught times epsilon sub naught times B times C times C. Because we still have the C from over there. And E is C times B. Well, let me write it C times B. That makes it a little bit less confusing. So C times B. And of course, we can divide B by both, on both sides. So that means we get 1 is equal to mu sub naught, epsilon sub naught, times c squared. If we solve that for c, we get c squared is equal to 1 over mu sub naught, epsilon sub naught. And finally, when we take the square root of both sides, we get the speed of light is equal to 1 divided by the square root of mu sub naught times epsilon sub naught. And that was a great discovery made by Maxwell. When he used Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law, Ampere's law, Gauss's law, and combined them all, describing electromagnetic radiation, he discovered that the speed of light is simply equal to 1 over the permeability of free space and permittivity of free space. Now, if you remember that epsilon sub naught is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, and mu sub naught is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, if we multiply those two together, take the square root, and take the inverse of that, we should get the speed of light. And just for, hmm, just so we can see that that's indeed true, let's try that. 8.85 e to the 12 minus times 4 times pi times 1 e to the 7 minus equals, take the square root of that, and then take the inverse of that, and sure enough, we get 2.9986. So this is therefore equal to 2.9986, which is, of course, not quite exact because we don't use enough significant figures there, but close enough times 10 to the, um, let's see here, 10 to the 9th, 8 meters per second. There we go. And so that's, of course, approximately equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And that was discovered by Maxwell more than 100 years ago. He was able to mathematically, using his equations, the ones that he combined into a single organized fashion of describing electromagnetic radiation, he was able to determine by that the speed of light. An amazing discovery, simply by using Gauss's law, Ampere's law, and Faraday's law describing electromagnetic radiation. So, there we go. We have now two very important discoveries. We know the relation between E and B, the electric field oscillations and the magnetic field oscillations. And then we have the relationship of the speed of light with the permeability, permeability and permittivity of free space. Amazing stuff. If you're still interested, keep watching because we have some other good stuff here describing electromagnetic radiation using these equations.